Welcome to Backpacker Radio presented by The Trek. Today is February 5th, National Shower with a Friend Day. <laughs> I love that. When's the last time you recall showering with a friend? Um, like maybe on trail. Maybe there's been like a communal shower set up. I'm trying to think. I don't really do it often. Yeah. There's not many times that would come to mind. Like summer camp. Sure. Yeah. If uh, my wife doesn't count... I probably have to go back to like high school football. Honestly. Yeah, I'm thinking like communal, sh- like the showers that have doors. Yeah, like not move not, over, give me the water. Right, soap on a rope style. Yeah, I'm your co-host Zach Badger Davis. Sitting to my right is I am Juliana Chauncey, aka Chauncey. Few quick reminders before we get to today's interview. The first one is we are looking for an intern. Mm-hmm. You put together the form today. I have yet to vet it, but I'm sure it's awesome. Yes. Um. We're looking for, it's like, this is so hard because we're not looking for anything super specific. No, we just want you to be awesome. Yeah, we are looking for a personality hire, um, preference to, like, in our ideal world, maybe someone local to the Denver Golden area, but not required by any means. Um, you know, we're we're doing a lot of stuff on social media lately. We've been adding on, like, things to YouTube. We're always growing in that way. So if you have skills with either video editing um, Sarah, your job's safe, don't worry. Um, or like YouTube analytics, knowing how to grow stuff like that. Um, just any interest in like how social media and podcasting combine in the world of the internet. Um, we're looking for someone who has skills that can just help take us, you know, one step further as we continue to try to go one step further. Yeah. And a little bit of full disclosure, uh, we are a little bit ahead in our recording production yeah. right now. So by the time you look at the form, we'll have a better flesh out idea of exactly what we're looking for. Yeah, this is our first podcast back after the holiday break. Yeah. So we're still remembering how to do our jobs. Um, yeah, my brain's still full of like chocolate sprinkles and mm-hmm. all that good stuff. But um, yeah, essentially, I've done this with the Trek before and it's turned out awesome. Uh, shout out Kendra, who's now moved up many times but we're looking for someone who's a swiss army knife who's got it all who listens to the podcast who gets it um and we'll likely have a more refined idea of who you are by the time that this episode comes out so definitely head to the link in the show notes and check out the description to see if it matches something that you're interested in because uh that will be a better version than what we just gave you yeah uh next thing is if you're taking on a long distance backpacking trip in 2024 would love to have you on the trex team application to join our team of bloggers is in the show notes and lastly but certainly not leastly is i think we are one week out from the launch of the badger sponsorship and holy moly this is a gigantic sponsor list this year we have even more brands worth even more in value that we're going to be giving away Um, various prize packages. I think we'll have about 14 prize packages this year. And 100% of the proceeds will go directly to Leave No Trace. So this is a win-win. You can get some awesome gear while supporting a cause near and dear to the hearts of anyone who loves being outdoors. I shouldn't say anyone. People who like to be outdoors and don't like to like step over trash and nasty trails and all that stuff. So presumably that's you. Okay. Let's get to our interview. Love the trail name on this one. Can't wait to get the story behind that. We are joined by Bailey Pseudosloth Bremner, who's an experienced through hiker who's done the CDT, Pinhoti, Bent Mackay. In addition to creating her own custom border to border routes across Colorado, dubbed the Columbine route, as well as an entire Mexico to Canada route, which she completed in 2023. And she does this all with her two dogs. Bailey, thank you so much for joining us here on Backpacker Radio. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. So let's jump right into the trail name origin story. Yeah, uh, so I didn't wear it today. I It all started with this hat. So I went on a like a road trip before one of my through hikes, and I was on a search for a new hat because my old one had worn out. And I couldn't find any good ones. I was really disappointed there weren't any good dinosaur ones at Dinosaur National Monument, which disappointing finally like three weeks into this trip i was in oregon in rockaway and went into like a little tchotchke shop and found a hat that just had a sloth's face on the top and it just was like that's the hat that's it and then the next day i was talking to my friend um who i was going to be hiking the great divide trail with and i was joking because i had heard one of your podcasts and you guys were talking about hawaiian shirts i was like we should get hawaiian shirts how funny would be if they had sloth hawaiian shirts and of course Amazon has everything. So Amazon had this beautiful sloth Hawaiian <laughs> shirt with a sloth 
riding a T-Rex that's shooting lasers from its eyes <laughs> in outer space. So I ordered it, and then I've worn that and its predecessor shirts yeah. um, ever since. And then I have a new hat now because my old one died, but yeah. try to go with the sloth theme. So. Amazon had, like... The Hawaiian shirt game was not that good in 2017. No. Yeah. I had to buy a male Hawaiian shirt because there were no female ones. And then Did you get yours at a thrift store also? No, I got mine from Tipsy Elves. And uh, then I re-sewed it to fit. Got it. Like, that's how hard it was to find yeah. Hawaiian shirts. And now you can find them with sloths and lasers. Yeah, there's all sorts of I'm so of things. jealous. Yep. Cat tacos, Jeez. unicorn, ice cream cones, all what sorts of things. What a time to be alive. <laughs> yep. Are you a slow hiker? Is that where the sloth comes from? <laughs> So I probably more of like average, but the year that my friend and I hiked the Great Divide Trail, there was a lot of people that were triple crowners. Plus, I think dirt, that was the year Dirt Monger hiked and mm. a whole bunch of other people. And so we just felt very slow. We had both only hiked the Colorado Trail before that. And so we were joking with somebody else and they're like, oh, you're not slow. You're and we're trying to get a new name. And she was like, your name should be Pseudo Sloth. So and I liked it. I kind of have like a sciencey background and like that it sounds the same but it's not spelled the same and it's just kind of stuck yeah so, so sciencey background what is the background um so i just i've worked in different science fields i wanted to be a vet when i was a kid and um study animal science in college and then now i've been teaching math and science hmm. around hiking so yeah well, i know you're in the field of animals because you've done is it all of these hikes or most of them? Most of them. Okay. So I attempted to hike the Colorado Trail with my dogs in 2018, and I didn't really have any backpacking experience before that. So, and, you know, Colorado is very rocky. There's a lot of granite. So we made it to Kenosha Pass, and things weren't going well. And part of it was just I didn't have the experience to know how to handle the problems we were having. Um, and at that time, that was very much the mindset of, like, one and done. I'm going to do this and then get a job and move on with my life. Um, so I ended up sending them home and then finished that trail and was like, oh, snap. Like, I kind of want to keep hiking and doing other trails. Um, did the Great Divide Trail. And then after that, um, just got some more, like, weekend trip experience in the San Juans. Um, you know, like, shorter, like, 40-mile loops and kind of figured out some of, like, my gear choices a bit better. Um, and then the next year, uh, did my own loop around the San Juans. Um, and like uh, northern New Mexico and we still had problems but worked through most of them we're able to finish and I've just been hiking with them from there nice so. um the important question what kind of dogs do you have yeah tell uh, me about your dogs for sure so I have two dogs um I have a German Shepherd um she's sable so she's more like brown undercoat with like black tips and like a dark black face and her name is Prima um and she's well, I'll get to that second. um and then I have a small 10 bound border terrier so they're a fox hunting breed from the border of england scotland um and her name is skittles and they are both 10 and a half so they're good little Aww. buddies <laughs> yeah Aww. are they still able to keep up on trail yeah i mean we just finished yeah. our hike yeah, and right. they did the whole thing so they're um other than prima has pretty sensitive feet but as far as like mileage wise and stuff they both are still doing well i mean i take them to the vet and get everything checked and yeah. try to keep them active so they don't like slow down too much but and you yeah. said the shepherd is also 10 and a half mm -hmm. that's great do you do any supplements or yeah yeah so i think for her it's kind of a combination of things um so she uh i used to do like dog showing i started out in 4-h and then started doing more of I that like in college yeah um so i worked for her breeder when i was in college and we're still really good friends so i know like a lot about her structure and know like her family history, her and her parents and all of her siblings have had like their hips and elbows x-rayed um, and they all look good. Um, and then I do do like glucosamine and I think just taking them to the vet and having their teeth cleaned and that keeping them active, just all those things together mm. has helped a lot. Just depends on the individual dog, but she's done well, so. Yeah, how important is the teeth cleaning? Cause this is one I've waffled on quite a bit <laughs> cause it's so damn, ex the teeth cleaning's not expensive, but to get like them sedated mm -hmm. to get the testing is, yeah, it adds up very quickly. Yeah, so I am not a vet, so you should of course talk to your vet. Yeah. Um, I did work for vets a little bit like around college and stuff, but I, don't, I feel like it doesn't hurt anything. If anything, it helps just um, like, I know my family had a dog that lived to be 16 and when he got his teeth cleaned and all the bad ones removed when he was like 13 or 14, he was a completely different dog. So uh -huh. I think, you know, just your teeth health, like even for humans, right? It helps like your heart health and everything else. So yeah. 
doesn't hurt anything. I think just like preventative health in general. Yeah. Making sure that. Shit, I'm at the pot for yeah. cleaning this year. It's hard. Mine yeah. need both need theirs clean too, but it's like my bank account's pretty sad after this hike. So I'm like, all yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. It was much more than I was expecting. I'll yeah. say that much. It's more than my trip to the dentist. Oh, yeah. A lot more. <laughs> um, do you have anything, like any tips that you may have picked up on as you've gone? I, I don't want to go too far in one direction or another right yet, but one of your dogs being 10 pounds is like blowing my mind because when I did the Colorado trail, I did most of it with my ex's dog who was 18 pounds. And I ended up carrying this dog most of the hike because it was just tired and you could tell it was not loving it. Um, how do you make accommodations for her being 10 pounds? Yeah, I think for the most part, she actually does weigh better than Prima or myself. She's the best hiker out of really? the three of us. Hmm. Um, I think part of it's just because she's smaller, it puts like less wear and tear on her feet in general. I mean, we had a little bit of problems this last trip just because it was so rocky, but um, I think it just really depends on the dog. To me, like their physical structure is really important just as far as, um, you know, anyone that's done 4-H or anything like that or showing any sort of animals knows about um, like how their legs are. Are they like parallel to each other? Are their toes turning out? Just like most dogs have something, but as long as it's like not a whole bunch of those things piled on together, because that adds wear and tear over time. So that's part of it. Um, I think it's also just getting them used to it, their personality and temperament. Um, you know what breed of dog they are. Most terriers, I think, do pretty well with longer distance hiking. Um, border terriers were bred to be able to run alongside like horses on fox hunts. So they have fairly long legs for their size and can keep up. Um, they would carry them on the horses a lot, but just personality, their breed history, if they have a breed or what you think they might be, if they're a mixed breed and then, um, just getting them used to it over time. It just depends a lot on the dog, I think, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It sure does. <laughs> what? I guess we're going straight down the dog rabbit yeah. hole right away. <clears throat> Are we going to commit? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. What is your daily mileage look like? And I assume that's changed over the years. A little. It kind of actually depends more on the time of year and the terrain. Um, so I didn't start through hiking. I mean, I attempted to through hike their first through hike when they were five. Their first one they completed, they were seven. So technically, that's considered a senior for dogs. You know, mm. for smaller dogs, it's kind of debatable. But yeah. um, their mileage has been fairly consistent. Um, they, I think, longer term, especially if it's like road walking or a lot of granite. Um, those tend to be harder on their feet. Um, so usually doing like 15s with a couple zeros thrown in have the most success. In the summer when the days are longer and I'm trying to make up time, um, we can do 20s pretty consistently. I just have to watch their feet pretty closely. That's the biggest determining factor. Um, they've both done 30 mile days several times, um, usually not back to back, but they can do that and then do a shorter day or do a couple 20s after that, just fine. Yeah. Uh, that I mean, it's so crazy to me that a ten and a half year old German Shepherd can do those kinds of miles. I mean, I'm this is giving me energy because yeah. I have a uh, German Shepherd mix. She's seven, and I'm like constantly looking for signs of her slowing down and like she's a little bit stiff getting yeah. up in the morning. But yeah, I would never dream to try to do those kinds of miles. So you're doing something right, obviously. And I think it really is just watching and seeing how they're reacting, and then just building up slowly. So I did a lot of backpacking. Last winter, I had a goal of doing like one backpacking trip a month for a year at minimum. So we were doing a lot of trips beforehand, which I think helped. And then um, I noticed that she, my shepherd Primo was acting a little funny at the beginning of our hike. She was still really happy and like wanting to get up, but was wobbling a little bit, especially in the afternoons after we take like a break and start again, she'd be kind of wobbly as she was like trying to run around. So then I just took her into the vet. We found out she does have some arthritis in her back and so they said, take these anti-inflammatories that are specifically for dogs, you know, give her a couple days off and then just take it slow and see how she's doing. And she's been fine ever since then. She's still on those. Um, I haven't ever seen any other signs of her slowing down. I kind of suspect that some of that was from her feet too. Um, but I think just, yeah, keeping an eye on them and then working with your vet. The vet we saw said she's fine to keep hiking as long as she seems happy and isn't showing any visible signs. So mm. just depends on the dog, I guess. But mentioning her feet do you do anything to keep like them in shape well over the hike because i know there's musher's paw like there's all the different things you can use for their feet 
Yeah, so I've tried almost everything under the sun, and I have not found a magic bullet for my dog. I think it depends on the dog. Different dogs get sore feet for different reasons. Um, I've used the Musher Secret. I've used other beeswax-based, um, like, salves. I've tried other things, but um, really, if it's not, like, some of them make their feet too soft. Like, I used Bag Balm for a bit, and that caused way more problems than it solved just because then she was getting more sores. Um, so the beeswax is better. Um, I've tried boots. The biggest issue is my shepherd has dew claws on her front feet and nobody, well, there's only one brand that makes boots that don't rub the dew claws, but then those were rubbing other spots on her feet. So I do kind of a combination. I use boots and a salve and then just days off. Really the biggest thing is just taking zero days if she's looking sore and then, um, she heals up. I think the biggest thing for her is just the dry air. The dry air with the rocks. She did way better on the Pinhoti where it was a lot more humid. So, Before we move past boots, do you use socks with the boots? I've tried socks and no socks, and it hasn't really made a difference. There's also uh, some people say like wrapping their dew claw with vet wrap so that it holds it in place helps, and I haven't really found that to help either. It kind of just maybe it takes a little bit longer before it rubs enough to make a sore, but yeah. Mm. <laughs> Got it. You mentioned that uh, you getting them dialed in for backpacking early on was just trying to get their gear correct. What changes did you make there? Yeah, I think it was more changing just all of our gear in general. When I started the Colorado Trail, since I hadn't done any backpacking before, um, I had like a bigger pack and I was fairly light, but I had like some unnecessary things like the tote that all the first aid stuff comes in instead of taking it out, putting a Ziploc, you know, things like that, carrying a Nalgene instead of a smart water bottle. Um, so that was part of it was just getting a lighter backpack, getting rid of some unnecessary stuff. Um, part of it too is just me getting used to carrying all the stuff. Um, at this point, I'm much more used to carrying like way more weight than I was then being more realistic about like mileage. Um, on that trip, I tried to have my shepherd carry a pack and I found that just for her, especially because she does have sensitive feet, um, that it's not really worth dealing with the pack. It's just easier for me to carry everything. And again, I know some people that have through hiked with dogs and their dogs wear a pack and they do just fine. But I feel like um, her not wearing a pack has added to her longevity and being able to hike to an older age. Um, I hate having to constantly adjust it for like the weight. And then I think it also is just like less, less weight on her feet. So. Mm. What do you do in terms of food? Are you using the dehydrated dog foods? I am cheap, so no. <laughs> um, so I do, um, I use kibble, and there's a couple reasons for that. So I feed the, usually period or pro plan, the performance or sport. Um, sometimes I've used other things like the Victor High Pro, just similar high calorie, but also high fat and protein. Um, dogs, from my research, mostly metabolize protein and fat when they're doing endurance activities. Um, the nice thing about the Purina Pro Plan is you can't find it in every town, but if the town is big enough to have like a tractor supply or a Murdoch's or like some sort of farm and ranch store, which there are a fair amount of those in the Mountain West, which is where most of the hiking I've done is, um, you can usually find a bag of that, um, which just makes it easier to get it while you're on trail. Um, and then the nice thing with that is even though it's still bulky and it's still heavy, you don't need as much of that as just like a regular food. So I just feed that year round and then just increase or decrease the amount. Um, at the end of the day, I just carry a lot more weight than pretty much everyone else. The nice thing is because my dogs are getting older, they're eating a lot less now than they were like two or three years ago. So that's made it kind of nice on some of our longer carries. Mm. Do you have a rule of thumb in terms of how much food they're eating per day? Um, so... When we did our first trip, they lost a whole bunch of weight and I wasn't really, I was kind of eyeballing it. So before I did the Continental Divide Trail, I kind of took how much calories I thought they were burning based off how, how much I was feeding them and just doing the math with like, you know, on the bag, it tells you how many um, big C calories or kilocalories are in like a certain amount of food. And so I took how much I was feeding them, figure out how many calories, big C calories that was. Um, and then there's kind of like, I don't remember what the rule of thumb is. I think people say like doubling that amount. And so I doubled that, converted it to the food I wanted to feed, and then started out with that amount. Um, my dogs actually gained a whole bunch of weight. Mm. 
the first like two or three weeks on the CDT. So then I was able to dial them back. And then from there, I've been kind of able to just feed based off of their like body condition. So if I notice them getting a little bit thin, then I'll increase their food. If they're getting a little chubby, then I just kind of dialed it back a little bit. Is there, in terms of weight, how much would you estimate that you're carrying per day? <sighs> like total or? Yeah. Um, it depends. So my base weight is usually in the neighborhood of 20 pounds. Um, you know, carrying everything, the dogs quilt, the dogs have a toy, nail clippers, all the things. Um, it depends on if it's summer. I usually am definitely like that 19 or 20. Winter, I have a little bit more things, so it gets a little heavier. Um, with the dog food and the people food, it just depends. Um, most of my food carries on my last couple of trips have been more in the like five days is a pretty nice carry. It's usually more like six, seven. I've had some eight and a half day carries in Idaho and um, Nevada. Um, so that gets to be, I think, more in that like 45, 50 pounds. And that just depends on how much water I'm carrying with that. Because mm. I've definitely had some pretty dry stretches too. So Do you a have lot. a rough <laughs> idea in terms of weight of their food? Oh, uh, weight of their food? I don't think I've ever actually weighed it. So, well, I did, I guess, before the CDT. I want to say like, so these days I've been feeding like one quart size bag of dog food to both dogs. So my terrier gets like a little and the shepherd gets the rest approximately you know it goes up and down um but it's usually like my kind of baseline and that probably weighs like a pound and a half ish i would say approximately and they yeah. get one of those per day so got it so are you carrying about the same weight of food for them as you are for yourself yeah. oh yeah <laughs> yes like it's pretty heavy especially for like you said the eight day haul yeah how big is your pack um this currently it's a it's the Hyperlite Mount Gear 3400, so I think I don't remember how many liters that is, but um, I had the 2400 before that, and I don't, I, I'm not sure how I fit everything in there, but yeah, sometimes I'll like carry like a bag uh -huh. of just the extra food until I eat it down. But and you mentioned that the shepherd is not wearing a pack, is the terrier? No, the thing is, most packs are not made to be used for dogs that small. Um, so if I had a pack for her, it'd probably have to be custom. So it'd yeah. be like 200 bucks. And the estimate for like how much weight they can carry is between about 10 and 25% is really more like dogs that are like draft type dogs that were meant to carry weight. Most yeah. dogs is like 10 to 15%. So with that, like by the One time pounds. the pack weighs like a pound, half a pound, yeah. almost a pound, she'd be able to carry like some poop bags and maybe some treats. So yeah. <laughs> we won't be able to really carry much, but yeah. You get three kibbles today. Yeah. <laughs> do you bring, you mentioned treats just now. Do you bring certain treats for them, certain toys for them? Um, What's the extra stuff? So they have a quilt that they sleep on. Um, sometimes in the winter I'll bring like a Z, like a cut down Z light or like a Gossamer Gear Thin Light um, just to give them some extra insulation. My Terry usually sleeps in my quilt, but for my Shepherd. Um, yeah, the food. Um, I don't usually carry designated treats these days if I really most of the times we're like way out where we don't really see anyone anyways um if I'm in an area with a lot of people and I'm trying to work on training then I'll just use some of their kibble because they're both pretty food motivated so they think that's pretty great mm -hmm. um I do bring a toy for them because they're spoiled and my shepherd likes to play with it in the mornings sometimes so um it just is like a little the one this time was log shaped I try to keep them like smaller um I bring nail clippers just because surprisingly enough even with all that walking they do not grind their nails down enough to keep them short so i clip their nails about once a week it's every two weeks if i'm lazy um all the boots all the foot care stuff which just really depends on what i'm trying at the moment since i experiment a lot um i usually have an extra food bag just because of all the extra food so recently i've just been bringing like um just like a different d extra dyneema bag since it folds down pretty small um and then like a bear bear hanging stuff um i think that's most of the main stuff they don't have extra water i guess would be the big thing is extra water capacity i have an extra dog designated water bottle and then a lot of extra bladders hmm. is the toy a squeak toy um you know i don't think it's it's really squeak she's not super big on squeaking she just likes to like hold it in her mouth and like shake her head and throw it around so yeah i'm trying to picture imagine waking up at like a tent site to the sound <laughs> of a squeaky <laughs> toy yeah yeah, it's always a fun noise to hear in the middle of the night. 
Um, okay, so I want to make sure that I've got the trail resume correct here because you mentioned the Colorado Trail. Did you end up through hiking that? Yeah, so I, fin- I just finished it without them since I'm from Denver. Yeah. My parents just came and picked them up and then I finished. But. Cool. So uh, Colorado Trail, CDT. So I actually did the Colorado Trail, then the Great Divide Trail um, the next year. And then um, the year after that, I did a 750-mile loop starting and ending in Durango. So it was around the San Luis Valley. Um, so it was mostly the CDT was the first like third of it. Um, then I went across the, um, kind of by like the Rio Grande in Northern New Mexico and over towards Taos. Um, and then I ended up having to road walk from Taos up to the great sand dunes, um, and then hike to the rainbow trail and up in the Sangre de Cristo wilderness, um, until I got to the Colorado trail and then hike the Colorado trail back to Durango. So. Yeah, so. Is this a pre-established loop or uh, something that no? You just... That was the first one that I made up. So Got most it. of it was using established trails. It was just I was linking them yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely want to circle back to that. Yeah. Okay, so then and then the CDT. <laughs> yeah, so Colorado Trail, Great Divide, Loop, CDT, Pinhoti, and Benton Mackay. Is that correct? Yeah. So I did half the the Benton Mackay. I just did Amicola Falls, um, basically Amicola Falls too. Flag Mountain, so okay, yeah, have the BMT to where it connects with the Northern Pinhoti and then the Pinhoti Trail. Got it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you definitely want to talk a lot about your two big routes, but I'm always really interested with people who take huge jumps, especially early on in their backpacking career, and to go from the Colorado Trail to the Great Divide Trail, I, I think says a lot about the person. What was <laughs> the inspiration to take on the Great Divide as your second trail? Yeah, so I'm glad you said that because it was a big jump. Um, and I think the main reason was, um, like I kind of mentioned before, when I hiked the Colorado Trail, I'm from Denver, so I did that as like a, I'm graduating college and I don't know what I'm doing. Let's hike the Colorado Trail. It's right in our backyard. Um, and it was supposed to be one and done, and then I'll get a job and move on with my life. Um, and then I met one of my really good friends that we've been really great friends since then. While we were hiking, I ran into her like three different times. Um, her trail name's Quill. And so after finishing the Colorado Trail, I was really struggling and like, what am I doing? I want to hike again, but life, uh, all the things. Um, and we were texting each other about how terrible adult life is. Um, and she was originally thinking of hiking the Oregon Desert Trail, which she has since hiked. Um, but since we were talking, she sent me John Z's video of the Great Divide Trail. And I was like, I've been kind of wanting to do this, but not by myself. Do you want to do it with me? And I watched the video. And of course, anybody that's seen it, it's this big, beautiful video of the Canadian mountains. And oh my gosh, it's lovely. And so I was like, sure, why not? Let's do it. So fortunately, that was in the fall. Um, so we had time to get all of our permits and all of our planning and go. Um, I was also fortunate that I hiked it in 2019, so the Gut Hooks app was already out by then, which makes it quite a bit more feasible. But it was definitely a learning curve. Um, I had done a class through the Colorado Mountain Club when I was in college on orienteering, so I was a little familiar with off-trail hiking, um, which helped. And then I think just having another person to do it with where when you're having a terrible day and it's really wet and brushy or the trail's just gone or whatever, then we could complain. And usually it worked out that there were very few times when we were both in a bad mood. It was usually one of us was in a good mood. One of us was in a bad mood. So the one that was in a good mood could kind of like cheer up the other person. Support system. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So that made a big difference. Uh, I think just doing it with the other person was a huge help. And just before we go too far into it, if someone hasn't heard of the Great Divide Trail, can you give the brief rundown yeah. of where it goes? So basically the Great Divide Trail is kind of like the Continental Divide Trail, but in Canada. So the official trail goes from the U.S.-Canada uh, border in Waterton, on the boundary of Waterton Lakes National Park in Canada and Glacier National Park in the U.S. Um, and it runs along the divide, which also is the divide between Alberta and British Columbia, Canada. Um, and the official current, so the terminus situation is kind of weird. The official terminus, I think, is Mount Robson. Most people hike to Kakwa Lakes. We ended up just doing from um, East Glacier and hiked through Glacier National Park um, and then ended in Jasper. Just I had to go back to school. My friend was having some like injury problems. So we did about the same distance, just a little bit further south. You mentioned you did it in the fall. Do you have to pay attention to the weather more significantly being that far north 
So we actually did it in the summer. We decided, oh, like, decided made our plants fall. hike in the fall. Got it. So I was way, sitting here like, yeah, is no, she nuts? <laughs> no, the biggest thing is just with the permits. The permit system opens, at least when we hiked it in January. So if you can plan to hike that hike before January so you can try to get your permits, yeah, that makes it a little easier. Um, the permit situation is just kind of a mess no matter what, but yeah. <laughs> Is this one you did with the pups? No. So I did that one without the dogs, which it is dog friendly. The nice thing about Canada is you can have dogs in their national parks. And I know of at least two people, I think, that have hiked it with their dogs. They just have to be on leash in national parks. Um, but I'm glad I didn't because my skill level was just not there yet to do it with the dogs. Mm. Um, I think they could do it now. But yeah. yeah. To that point, only having done the Colorado Trail, not to say only, but big jump yeah uh, were there any points on this hike where you felt like you were in over your head um probably not in over your head there were certainly days that were a little rough um it was a very wet year the year we hiked unfortunately i think the worst of the rain was when we were on pretty good trails in banff so we had like logs to cross we didn't have any super crazy cr water crossings when the water was really high but i saw some videos of some pretty nasty ones um, I don't know how it is now. I think that was the first year they switched. So section section D is the most notorious for being like pretty terrible trail. A lot of it's not um, used by very many people. Um, so we did one alternate, which was on nice trail, the Iceland trail. Um, but then from there, it's like off trail down into another valley and over a pass. And so that was a pretty good learning experience. Again, it was nice to have another person. I've done a little bit of off trail. Um, there was kind of a line to follow, but... Uh, that was kind of a, a big learning experience. And then the rest of that section was either bushwhacking with a trail, just not a very defined trail. And then a lot of floodplain walking, which was nice because in previous years you were in the forest following an old trail that like didn't really exist. So, hmm. yeah. Okay. So you hiked the great divide trail after the Colorado trail, <clears throat> you've done a traditional trail and then one that's a level up. You decide to do the 750 mile loop. What is it about these less conventional hikes that are attractive to you? Yeah, I think I came back from, okay, so I should back up a little bit. First things first, you should know that I'm like a major nerd. I'm like really into Lord of the Rings and like other like sci-fi fantasy types books, but definitely love Lord of the Rings, love like maps. I brought the whole like two pound 50th anniversary edition of Lord of the Rings with me on the Colorado trail <laughs> and read the whole thing. Do you listen uh, to soundtracks while you hike? Uh, not really, but you got yeah, it. Not really, but yeah. Um, I guess I have it in my head sometimes going up okay. passes. Yeah. Um, so I love like the idea of adventures and going off on adventures and that kind of thing, exploring, um, which gets me in trouble sometimes. But so that's the beginning. That's part of why I hiked the Colorado Trail. So I think doing the Great Divide Trail, even though it was really rough at times, um, I also learned and grew so much and just. It was such a different experience. Um, we met, my friend and I met plenty of other hikers, but we mostly met them when we were in towns. We didn't really see a lot of other people on trails um, other than the popular trails like the Rockwall Trail in Banff and the Skyline Trail in Jasper National Park. Um, so I think it just that problem solving aspect that comes with hiking something a little bit rowdier of like, well, where are we going? How are we gonna get there? That passes way up there and there's no trail. Like, how are we gonna get there? Um, some of the food and like logistical aspects um, it can be very frustrating, but it's also super rewarding to work through that. So when I came back from that, um, I was going into my master's program. I just moved to Durango and I was like, oh, like I want to do more off trail stuff. So I just started taking my dogs um, and making up my own routes on Gaia. That's when I first started really getting into making routes on Gaia and trying to hike them. And the nice thing is there's a lot of trails and roads um, in the San Juans that you can use. And then a lot of the off trail stuff, there's a lot of alpine that's pretty open, so you can just kind of go and explore. I would just go up by Silverton before school and just go wander around and see what's up there. And so um, really enjoyed that. And so when COVID rolled around, that kind of really messed up my original plans. I was supposed to go um, to my cousin's wedding in Italy, and of course that wasn't gonna happen at that point. So I was like, well, what can I do? Um, and I. I think at some point I had thought it would be kind of cool to include the Sangre de Cristo mountain range as part of like a through hike with the Colorado trail. And so I just sat down, I have a huge collection of Nat Geo maps. I just got them out, got out my road atlas and just started looking at it and seeing if there was even like a possibility to put something close to home together. 
um, that I could make feasible for COVID and doing with the dogs and just kind of go explore. Hmm. We've talked to several people, obviously like many people, um, who do route finding, right? Like that's one of the things that we've touched on in several episodes. When we asked them about like how you got started in route finding, none of them so far have said something like, well, I took a college course in orienteering. What kind of advice do they start you off with when you're in a school setting that's teaching orienteering? Yeah, so this was like, first thing you should know is it's not like an actual college course. It's a course through like an organization, okay. kind of like REI offers orienteering classes too. So I think, I don't remember how many week long class it was. I think it was like eight sessions and four of them were classroom and four of them were in the field and it included everything. It included the 10 essentials like just basics of hiking. But then a big aspect was how to use map and compass, um, how to like estimate your miles, how to find a point on a map using triangulation. Um, And it was just super nice because a lot of that stuff, like I don't really necessarily use in the field just because we're pretty lucky with how um, prominent most features are in the Mountain West that usually if you look at the mountains around. If you can read a topographical map, you can usually kind of figure out where you are. And then of course, if you have Gaia or any sort of navigational app on like your phone or GPS, then that makes it like 10 times easier. But it is, I think, a good skill to have in your back pocket. Um, It was just nice because it was like a group setting. So we had like competitions to like find certain points at a different area um, and just kind of have some of that hand holding of, we're gonna do this off trail hike from point A to point B and have cars dropped off. yeah, I don't. It was just kind of a nice skill set to have, and kind of added some confidence, I suppose. Hmm. Were there? Sorry, one more. Yeah. Were there any surprises when you switched over to then starting to set your own routes on Gaia? Was there anything that you were like just surprised about? Um, I think the biggest thing that has been a constant frustration, still is a constant frustration, is just that no map is one hundred percent accurate. Um, most of the topographical features are pretty accurate, but when it comes to trails and roads and human made features, those are not. Um, so there's been a lot of instances where I'm like, oh, I'm going to be hiking this trail. And then you get there and it's like covered in blowdowns or the trail's just not there at all. You get to a road or like, sometimes you'll find a trail that's not on your map and you're like, I don't know where this goes, but we're just going to go with it. (laughs) So that has been kind of a constant frustration, something that they definitely didn't talk about in that class. Mm. Have you found any ways in using your navigational tools to discern the reliability of a trail? Like if you reference multiple map layers and all of the layers have a trail, is it more likely to actually be there? 100%. That's I think the biggest thing I do is between paper maps. And then the nice thing is um, I splurge and I think it's worth it for me anyways to have the premium version of Gaia. So then I have multiple map layers and yes, if it's on more than one map, there's a good chance that it's at least somewhat there. It might still be fairly run down, um, but at least there's something. If it's like on one map, but not the other, or not the other two or three maps, then it's kind of like, oh, I don't know, it seems iffy. The other thing too is is a lot of times, if I'm really concerned, it's an area that I'm really not familiar with, especially on my most recent trip, because I had not really spent any time in Idaho or Nevada. Um, Sometimes I'll like look up the trail on the internet and see if there's like an all trails or something for it and if there's not that's always kind of a little concerning (laughs) it's like well there's no all trails for this trail i don't know if it's gonna be there yeah very cool so with your first custom route the uh, 750 loop mile loop um how did the hike itself compare to your expectations of it like how often did you run into instances where you were expecting a trail and there it wasn't there or Like you thought you could get up this very steep feature and it was just a cliff. Yeah. What what was the the reality versus the expectation? That one was pretty good. I think the the biggest thing was the majority of it was already using pretty long established trails. So a a pretty good chunk, not quite two thirds, but probably pretty close was on the Colorado Trail and the Continental Divide Trail. So that trail system is pretty well established. Um, Hiking in new mexico once i got off the cdt was a lot of roads and then there's pretty good trails around taos so that was good the biggest issue i ran into was probably private versus land public land ownership Um, most of the southern sangre de cristo mountains in colorado and then the very northernmost part northern 
New Mexico are all privately owned. And I was, one thing I ran into with the maps was Gaia does not distinguish between public roads or public easements and privately owned roads. And so that was the first thing I discovered was, um, fortunately I discovered it when I was kind of doing some recon and caching food. I cached food for that trip um, because of COVID. And so I was kind of doing some recon around La Vida Pass and I was like, oh, there's a gate on that road that I was planning on hiking and it says private property. <laughs> Maybe I should look into this more. And then I realized a road I was gonna use to cross the Colorado border was on this private hunting ranch. And I tried to email them, can I please walk across this road into Colorado <laughs> and they just kind of kept putting me off putting me off putting me off until I was in Red River and I was like oh I need to go because I have a job lined up already I got to finish so that's I ended up doing a big road walk around that section but hmm. that's probably the biggest thing did yeah. you have the dogs for this one I did have the dogs yeah how is that when you're going through like these like farmers lands because I imagine they probably aren't too stoked on dogs um you know I've actually never had an issue and I don't oh. know I mean I I also am really big on not letting my dogs chase wildlife or cows um you know sometimes cows will like run away from us but they're usually walking right next to me on like a road or whatever um I've personally always had really positive experiences with ranchers, especially ranchers that have like cattle. Not, I don't know this much about hunting ranches. I've had a few instances where I've tried my best to make a goodwill effort and have gotten somewhere and realized that it is not a public easement or a public road, that it is private property and everyone's always been super understanding and super nice. And oh, it's okay, it's fine. You know, what are you doing? Can we get you water? That kind of thing. So um, most people, I think if they, it helps that I'm a woman and it helps that I have dogs, but they're pretty like, Oh, what are you doing? Do you need anything pretty nice? So hmm. anything else about the 750 mile loop that you want to relay a, a creative way to fill some trail time in a COVID year? Yeah. I think it was a good stepping stool as far as going from hiking a rowdy or established trail to hiking a route that's still fairly es somewhat established trails as far as some of that learning curve of mm -hmm. um, the challenges of using Gaia and navigation, that kind of thing, um, as well as learning about hiking with the dogs. And um, like I so said, we had a lot of hurdles to overcome, especially because it was COVID. So it was like, I'm not going to go into town. I'm trying to like plan ahead, um, you know, learned a lot more about the feet, learned a lot more about the nutrition. That's the only hike where my shepherd has lost weight. Um, but yeah, made it to the end and it overall was enjoyable. So have you played around with Onyx at all? I have not. I'm curious. I've had several people I've talked to that have used it and I'd, I'd like to give it a try because I have some frustrations with Gaia these days, but yeah. yeah. I was thinking about that when she was talking too, because it tells you who owns the hunting lands yeah. and everything. Uh, yeah. And I was thinking for the private land yeah. issue. That would be and Gaia clutch. does have a private property layer. It's just, it doesn't distinguish if the road uh. is like a county road or if there's an easement or if it's a closed road private road mm. but you can click on it and if i was better prepared i would probably go through my whole route and you know on some of those questionable roads send them an email and be like hey is this road open or not mm. but do you know if onyx makes the that discernment with the roads i don't know and i just haven't had a chance to check but. yeah i don't know either i know they give a like also and i don't know but i've had like my parents have a farmhouse in upstate new york and i had a friend from college who like rented a plot of land to hunt on near theirs yeah and he was showing me this is like back years ago was showing me his onyx app because they had like all like you could click it and you could see my parents information yeah. like they're like all kinds of crazy stuff and that's so, how gaia is too i don't know how often it updates i think it's fairly often but like my folks just moved over the summer and their property it doesn't show them as the owners yet um but it does show like the land the name of whoever holds the land whether that's like an llc or like a private owner and then i don't know if it has like the f actual address i don't remember but it yeah. definitely has some info maybe not quite that much but huh. okay uh let's fast forward a bit because we've talked about these other trails before uh very curious to learn about your columbine route yeah how'd you come up with the name um you know i thought about it for a while i think i finally decided on the name while i was hiking um, and it just seemed fitting for those that don't know the Columbine, Colorado Blue Columbine is the Colorado State Flower. So it seemed like a fitting name. It also kind of works well in hindsight that there's the Colorado Trail starts with the sea, the Continental Divide Trail through Colorado starts with the sea. It's kind of like the third sea of Colorado, the Columbine route. So, and I know there's other routes that people hike through Colorado, but um, it just seemed like 
a fitting name so yeah no good name choice yeah. for sure um so in addition to running into the issue with um, private roads on the last hike what other takeaways did you get from that hike that helped you prepare for this one um i th- hmm. i think just being prepared mentally to know that some days you might be expecting good trail but the trail might not be as good as you think it is because <laughs> that really messes with your mileage especially and also just mentally it can be tough when you're like ready to do a 20 mile day and you get there and there's like a gazillion blowdowns and the trail just disappears and you're like where are we even going i don't know um that's probably the biggest thing is just learning how to do a little bit more research beforehand um as far as like oh i'm in lake city and i have this section coming up and i know there's less traffic in this area let's try to look up some of these trails so i kind of know what i'm going into um i think i also learned to just be flexible um i certainly adjusted my route quite a bit as i went as far as like well there's a fence here so let's go around i I was much more confident i think with just going off into the woods and just going completely off trail if there was public private land in the way um as well as being like well this trail is really crappy but there's a nice road up on this ridge let's I mean, there's no reason to suffer for no reason. Let's just go up and walk this road. So, yeah. How does the terrier handle the blowdowns? Uh, really well. Uh, half the time, uh, like, especially the really fuzzy ones, you know, and, like, live, a whole bunch of live trees fall down. I'll be, like, struggling inside my big pack on, and most of them are, like, you're trying to either crawl under or crawl over, and she just walks right under them. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's really unfair. <laughs> does she manage the, the blowdowns typically better than the larger dog? Oh! they're both pretty similar because they have different strengths and weaknesses sometimes um skittles will need like a little you know she's pretty easy to pick up luckily but sometimes i'll just give her a lift over like up on top of one or over one um prima is a little bit clumsier i think so sometimes you'll watch her struggle a little bit but i just let them figure it out and they just pick their own way through so skittles is a great name for yeah oh yeah (laughs) well she's a very happy dog too so it's very (laughs) funny Hard not to laugh thinking about a small dog named yeah. Skittles. I don't, that'll make me laugh for the rest of the day. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I guess we just give us an overview of the route. I, I know that's yeah. probably a task in and of itself, oh, yeah. but we'll try to keep up. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing was, well, so I went, I got my undergraduate at CSU in Fort Collins. So um, we, growing up, we would go camping up in the mountains west of Fort Collins. And then when I was in college, um, I did, that was a lot of some of the first hikes I did as an adult by myself was up there. Um, and I just love the Rewa area up by Cameron Pass. And so I was um, trying to figure out what I was doing with my life after the Pinhoti. I was really struggling with mental health. Um, and I just went for like a snowshoe hike up there and went up to Montgomery Pass and just walked on the ridge and was sitting up there with the dogs looking south towards Rocky Mountain National Park. Just thinking, boy, it'd be so nice to hike through the San Juans and connect that all the way up here to like one of my favorite areas and so again went back home and pulled out all my maps and was like what can i do to make this happen um one of my big goals was to hike basically like west of the divide so avoid the cdt and the colorado trail as much as possible and kind of see some areas of colorado that i've either just you know barely touched a little bit or want to see more of um so i started and of course going from the new mexico border to wyoming was kind of my goal was to go across the whole state Um, So I started out on the CDT south of Cumbria's Pass on the New Mexico border, and I did hike the CDT for the first about 100 or 120 miles to Silverton. Just there weren't really a lot of other options that looked more interesting in that section, and it's just such a beautiful... I love the South San Juans and the Weminucci's. So um, once I got to Silverton, I went and went through um, like around Mount Sneffels and made like basically a giant loop around Mount Sneffels. Um, and headed back towards Ure, went through the Uncompagre Wilderness, uh, and then headed towards Lake City, went through the Powderhorns, that was an area I was interested in, and then from there it was kind of like, how do I get up past Gunnison towards like um, the West Elks and towards like Crested Butte, so I just did some hiking through there and got up into the West Elks, and then that was one area I was really excited to kind of check out was that whole area west of Crested Butte and between like Crested Butte and Aspen, so um, I had done the four pass loop, but I hiked like half the four pass loop going through that area. Um, and then one Sorry, up, east yeah. or west of Crested Butte? West of Crested Butte. Yep. Um, from there, headed from like Aspen to Vale, so through the frying pan wilderness, kind of near Mount uh, Holy Cross. 
from the other place I really want to see is I've never done anything in the gores. So I went from Vail kind of up around the backside of the gores and hiked the gore range trail. Um, and then hiked up through the Ptarmigan Peaks Wilderness, which is pretty neat. Um, did a cool ridge walk in that section. Uh, and then the big challenge, of course, always is getting around the national parks. So um, I kind of knew from doing the CDT some route options to get past that section um, and get back up into the Never Summers. So I got kind of into the Never Summers and then connected that to the Raywall Range. Um, Remind me where the Never Summers are. Yeah, the Never Summers are north... Uh, north and kind of west of Rocky Mountain National Park. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the CDT goes through a little bit of it. Um, so I crossed the CDT there and got on the east side of the divide and then from there crossed um, Cameron Pass and then got up. It did the main thing I wanted to do, which is the ridge walk from Montgomery Pass and State Forest State Park to Clark Peak, which is a really prominent peak in northern Colorado. Um, is State Forest State Park a state park called yes. State Forest yes, yes, State yes. Park? That is it's hilarious. Really, it's really the funniest name. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to go there. It's, really, it's a cool place for sure. It's worth a visit. Uh, yeah. And so, of course, it was really foggy the day I did that ridge walk, which was extremely disappointing. Um, but we had good weather the rest of the day, hiked through the Raywall Wilderness, and then up along the crest of the Medicine Bow Range into Mountain Home, Wyoming. And that's where we finished. So. That's fascinating because, mm-hmm. yeah, the, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the Crested Butte area mm-hmm. and it's so cool. And it always strikes me like there should be a trail through yeah. there. Like, it's super scenic and yeah. most of the trails are pretty good through there. A little bit of road walking to connect some of that. But, yeah, it was super nice area. Really pretty. Yeah. Um, Do you have a map of this trail anywhere on the Internet? Um, I'm just following what you're saying. I should Google make maps. one. That's exactly I, what I was yeah. doing. <laughs> I saw you doing it and I got jealous. So I started doing it. <laughs> um, I have a GPX. I need to update it because, of course. You know, you make it beforehand and then you get there and you, you know, tweak some things. Um, I've never figured out, I think the closest I've gotten to figuring out how people make these nice maps of their routes is just like getting a map on like from Google and like doing the like draw thing on your mm. phone. I don't know how people make those nice maps, but I think that is kind of what part of what it. Yeah. I think Rachel does a bunch of that stuff, doesn't she? Yeah. If she doesn't have the answer, I'm sure. A lot of people listening do, yeah. so feel yeah. free, podcast at the trek.co, let us know. Um, how many miles was it, do you um, think? About, it, it's always hard to know with a route how much it actually is, just with the backtracking and everything. Um, I My estimate's about 700 miles. Oh, okay. Yeah. I had written that for the 2020 loop. That was about the same, about 750. Yeah, oh, they're okay. both in that like similar 700 miles. Got range. it, got it, got it. So you mentioned the first 100-ish miles was on the CDT. Did you spend any other time on the CDT? Nope, that was it. I crossed the CDT at, oh, what's the name of that pass? I had it the other day. There's a pass in the Never Summers right before you drop down to Grand Lake. I knew what it was the other day. So that was that was where I recrossed it because I stayed west of the CDT the whole entire time after that, and then just crossed it to get to the east side to get into. Is the... it Berthod Pass? Mm-mm. Okay, because I was we go over that to get yeah. to Grand No, Lake. this is in the wilderness. Got Bowen it. Pass. Bowen oh, okay. Pass. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, give us an overview of the route. Obviously, give us the geography, but yeah. like, how often are you on well-established trails? How much bushwalking? How much roads? Yeah. Most of it, so I tried hard. The nice thing about Colorado is we do have so many trails, um, and most of them are pretty nice, so I was on pretty nice trail a majority of the time, which was nice. Um, There were some spots mostly in, like, mineral, not mineral, like around Lake City where it was interesting trails. So coming down to Lake City on, I think it's called the 4th of July Trail, um, you're just walking along this trail. I'm like, oh, there's a trail here. And it just like gets fainter and fainter. And there's like more and more blowdowns. It just like disappeared. And I was like, all right, I guess we're just <laughs> going cross country now. Um, and then on the other side in the powder horns, same thing. There's trails closer to the roads, but they get a lot of blowdowns. And it just kind of fades away as you get closer to tree line. And then you're just kind of going for it through the willows and all that. Um, and then definitely that area past the powder horns where you're kind of north of like the Coach Topas there's private land towards like blue mesa and so i kind of went around that and because of that private land i was just basically like following the fence line that was like the private property public land boundary so that was all off trail 
Uh, and then some of the trails getting up into the West Elks were pretty run down. There was trails, but, you know, not super great. Um, and then I had, like, sometimes just roads, like, crossing. So I had a little bit of road walking around where you cross US 50 near Gunnison just because you got to get across the road somehow. Um, and similar, like, crossing I-70, I had a little bit of road walking around Vail, um, a little bit getting across. I think that's Highway 9 that goes um, north of Silverthorne towards uh, mm-hmm. Kremling. Just that was most of the road walking I had was just like crossing the major highways um, to get to the next trailhead. And then as far as other off trail, I think the biggest was um, I had like those two ridge walks. I did one ridge walk that was like off trail, like, oh, let's go from Bill's Peak to Byers Peak in the um, Byers Peak Wilderness and then the off-trail ridge walk that I knew was off-trail because I've hiked a lot up there around Cameron Peak. Hmm. So. Very impressive that you're able to make so much of this route a well-established Well, trail. the nice thing is just our state is so nice and yeah. we have so many nice trails. That's yeah. the biggest thing. There's so many good trails that you can use. And, of course, there's other parts of the states that the state where there's less trails, but most of it, we just have a lot of good trails here, which is yeah. a big help. I'm kind of, like, really impressed at how many of the mountain ranges and, like, forests and wildernesses that you're just rattling off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> once I look away from the map, the information leaves my head. You know, this is really impressive. She did grow up in Colorado as well. <laughs> yeah, but, like, put me in New York. I'm not doing better. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I just I also name... really like maps. I really yeah. like maps. So that I, I don't remember quite as many of them as I did before, but that helps a lot. And then once you hike it, then you have the map an actual landscape to put together and it just I think sticks a little bit better yeah but. not maybe not for everyone <laughs> like me <laughs> have you thought about tweaking the route a little bit in case somebody else wanted to do it or maybe further down the um, road you, you would do it to avoid those couple of yeah. areas where the trail ran out I mean so yeah I, I should I want to update the GPX I just was so busy doing other hikes last year I never got around <laughs> to it problem. um I mean there's maybe a couple things I would try to tweak I think they're are some other possibilities for getting through the coach topas. Um, but that's about it. I think for me, that's part of the character of the hike is like having that variety. I like the variety and I will mm-hmm. probably get into that with my most recent hike, but having that mixture of it's nice to have good trail, but you appreciate the good trail so much more after having like a terrible bushwhack. So yeah. that's cool. And in terms of the logistics with the pups, you know, in the situations where you're on a trail and then, disappears do you always have extra food on hand for such a scenario um so i don't necessarily carry extra food i think um what i have done in situations where i've been kind of not moving as fast as i want is i just you know sorry dogs but it's easier to ration dog food and then i always seem to end up with extra food for myself i think um the loop i did in 2020 uh, that was my first time caching food and I cached the whole entire hike and I discovered quickly that when you do not um, carb load in town, <laughs> you get way more hungry on trail and I was hungry for like that whole entire hike, hmm. like starving. I I think it was probably the trip I lost the most weight and so I think I've overcompensated on all of my trips since then where I'm like always bringing way too much food. <laughs> so I usually have extra that yeah. I've been able to take like on trail zeros and stuff without issues. So carb loading in town for you, do you do any special treats for the pups when you get to town? I usually do. So I usually get them like a little bone at the store that they can chew or like a can of wet food and give them wet food. Yeah. Sometimes every once in a while I'll really splurge for them and like get them like a cheeseburger from McDonald's or something. (laughs) Cheese tax. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. Uh, You know, I have so many questions about this route, but I also want to make sure that we get to the main event, which is the one that you just wrapped. Is there anything in particular that you want to convey about this route to somebody who might be interested in doing this or something similar? Um, I don't know. I'm a little, I'll be honest, I'm a little protective because I think some of those sections are just such a beautiful part of Colorado that I'm definitely happy to help people if they want to hike something similar. But I think part of the beauty of it is finding something that looks interesting to you and hiking through that section and um, that just makes it such a different experience of being like that part looks cool to me and I want to check it out or being hiking being on the trail and being like well that trail looks more interesting than the one I have on my map let's just go that way it looks like you know you can usually see the mileage it looks interesting so let's go that way there were there were several times where it was like 50 50 like well I can go that way or I can go this way and it's about the same number of miles Um, so I think that's a lot of it is just 
finding something that looks interesting to you Mm -hmm. and having kind of an objective and some like goals or parameters for when you're coming up with the route and then making something that you think is interesting to hike because then it's a lot more fun especially when it's terrible so yeah do you have any general pointers in terms of drawing up your own route like is it, is it literally just as simple as pulling up a Gaia map and just connecting the dots or is there something that might be less obvious that somebody listening to this wouldn't know um I think it probably depends on how OCD you are or how particular you are I feel like I'm kind of lazy as far as compared to some other people I know that hike routes where I'm like, oh, I'll figure it out when I get there. And it probably gets me in some situations where it's either A, less fun, or maybe not as pretty as it could have been if I had put in more time researching. Um, but that's, I think, part of the experience for me. So I think, you know, the more time you put in, especially researching the private land and the views and the trails, you might have a better route. Or if you want to be more like figure it out as you go, you can usually figure it out if you're flexible. A lot of it's just you know, being flexible and being willing to change things as you're going and not get all hung up on small things. Yeah. So did you have one particular standout section of this hike that you would love to go relive? The Columbine route. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. of that trail. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, well, <laughs> I've had that ridge walk from, um, so Cameron Pass is where Colorado Highway 14 crosses um, the front range in Northern Colorado. And then the next pass there's a nice day hike that goes up to Mont- Montgomery Pass, which is on that ridge line, that front range, like ridge line. Um, and I've hiked up to there several times. Um, so that hiking from there to Clark Peak has been on my bucket list for a long time. And I've hiked up to Clark Peak before just f- from the backside. So that was like half the reason I did that hike. And then I got there and it was foggy and I couldn't see anything. So that would probably be the one thing I'd, I'd really want to go back and do is go back and do it when the weather's actually nice and I can see everything. Yeah. So is it hard to not just like zero and wait for the weather to clear up when it is that circumstance? Cause I feel like if it's like I'm on the AT and I get a day of fog, it's just a day of fog on a long trail that, you know, I didn't choose the path for. Yeah. Whereas if you've built this path specifically to go through this section and you get there on a day that the weather's not great, like, is it, does it make it even harder to just keep going? Yes. Um, it depends. So like on that trip, I had a deadline. So like I couldn't wait around because that was the very end of the trip and I had to go back to work in like several days. So, um, but it does, especially because with the dogs, I'm much more willing, I think, to zero in my tent than most people because dealing with wet dogs is annoying. On the flip side, I've just accepted the fact that anytime I'm looking forward to a specific section of trail, the weather seems to be really crappy. So not all the time, but I really wanted to do Sneffels and it snowed, which I went back and did later. Um, There was another section, like the Gore Range. It was really rainy that day. I was like, all right, (laughs) that's cool. That section was really rainy. It's just, it's happened multiple times. It got rained on the sawtooths this summer. It's just like, okay, (laughs) just give up. Just do it and go back, I guess. Yeah, you just tell your brain you really don't want to see those. And then you'll go and the weather will be perfect. It just makes you imagine what's up there. Like, that's (laughs) probably really cool if there's no clouds there, but. Yeah. And how long did this hike take? Um, So it took me seven weeks, I think. Um, I did take about a week off in the middle around when I got to Gunnison. Just um, my dog had a vet vet appointment um, at the CSU vet clinic. And so I just took some days off, went and went to that appointment, um, taught a lesson. My friend has like a big week long herding symposium thing and helped her with that. um, And then went back and finished So. Does the seven weeks include the week off? I can't. uh, So I hiked from June 13th is when I started and I finished the very end of July because I went back to work on August 8th, I think. So I think I finished the first week of August, I guess. So. Yeah, that feels fast considering, you know, people usually do the Colorado Trail in a month Mm -hmm. and that's on a very well established trail with less thinking involved. Uh, do you feel like you were pushing? It, it sounded like you had a job that you were getting back to, so you were on yeah. a crunch. Um, I didn't really feel like I was pushing too much. Um, I definitely took a couple pretty short days. <laughs> so I think part of it was I just didn't really take zeros, especially because places like Aspen and Vail are very expensive. <laughs> so I would just like hike in, get some food, hike out, take like a Nero the day after that. Um, I had some bigger days. I think part of it is I tried to do like some bigger days first. If I know that I can then have a couple like Nero's after that with lots of food. So, Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I seemed, I think 
the seven weeks was not including the week off probably so maybe i don't know. yeah I, uh did you get a lot of questions from people like what are you doing because obviously you're not in prominent through hiking areas um it depends i think like on this trip not as much just because there's still hiking trails and people are still backpacking on some of them um like i met a couple groups backpacking like in the ragged ragged wilderness near crested butte of course plenty of people hiking the four pass loop when i was near the maroon bells um that kind of thing and generally you know when people ask me i just tell them oh i'm hiking to this point or you know for the day or just out backpacking yeah if people really dig then i'll answer but yeah um, most of the places it wasn't too out of place the biggest thing was probably around the powder horns when i was trying to get around the private land i met some people on like a four by four but cool well thank you for that rundown oh yeah <laughs> very interesting uh now we move on to the bigger hike tell us about the inspiration for this one and i imagine the planning that went into this was pretty intense yeah, it was definitely different. Um, so I have had this idea. I mean, of course, so there, I think most of your listeners probably know there's Pacific Crest Trail, Continental Divide Trail, Appalachian Trail are all pretty north-south across most of the country. Um, there's kind of this weird in between in the mountain west between the PCT and the CDT where there are some trails, but nothing that technically goes from Canada to Mexico. I've had the Idaho Centennial Trail has been on my list of hikes I've wanted to do. Um, I kind of wanted to do that in 2020, but I wasn't quite feeling confident enough with how remote it was at that time, especially during COVID. Um, and then there's the Arizona Trail, and then there's nothing in between them except the state of Nevada. And I've driven through Nevada in June and thought it was absolutely beautiful and stunning. Um, and so I. You know, just looking at the map was like, well, there's a trail sort of here and definitely established trail here. You can probably figure out how to connect them and then you have something to go from Canada to Mexico. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I did. I hiked starting the end of this last June on the U.S. Canadian border and the Idaho Panhandle, and then hiked through Idaho, Nevada and Arizona down to the Mexican border and just finished about a couple weeks ago. So. I feel like Nevada has popped up more in the last couple yeah. of months than the rest of the podcast history combined. Yeah, I think the world is pointing us in a direction. we got to move the podcast to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> this road trip. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Well, can you give us some of the nitty gritty of th those? Obviously, people know the Arizona Trail, yeah. and I'm sh a good number probably are familiar with the location of the Idaho Centennial. But give us a precise um, outline of those gaps. Yeah, so the Idaho Centennial Trail, first of all, people should know, um, even though it says trail and Idaho really wants it to be a trail, <laughs> it is my personal opinion that it is really more of a route. Um, there are blazes in southern Idaho in the Owyhee Desert and in the Sawtooths, but there, I only ever saw one other sign other than those areas. Um, and a lot of the trail is really terrible. There's also a lot more road walking, I think, than people realize. Um, I don't know how many people have done it, but there haven't been that many. I think probably more than people think, though. Um, Nevada, the interesting thing about Nevada is there are good trails in the Reno area, and there are some trails around Las Vegas, and then there's Great Basin National Park has trails. Other than that, there is the Ruby Crest Trail, which is fairly popular, and there's other trails in that area, but they're not maintained. And there are some trails in the Jarbidge Wilderness, but that is it. There are, like, no other trails in the state. That I, I mean, I'm sure there's a couple really small, short ones, but um, it's mostly a whole bunch of mountain ranges with, like, no trails in them and then, like, dirt roads in the valleys. Um, so, yeah, I, I've definitely seen, I think, some of the other people that have done, like, loops in Nevada and stuff. Um, a lot of people are hiking off trail on, like, the ridges. What I did was um, I picked up from where the Idaho Centennial Trail ends on the Idaho-Nevada border which is near the town of Murphy Hot Springs, Idaho, in Jarbidge, Nevada, and went into the Jarbidge Wilderness. Um, I had to reroute because the trail I was planning on hiking was really terrible and the weather was crappy, and I fortunately met a local that had all the deets on that, so I he told me which trails were good, and I hiked through that, and then road walked down to um, the Rubies, tried to hike some trails in the Rubies, and they were also really terrible, so then I road walked to the Ruby Crest Trail, <laughs> Um, hiked through Ruby Crest Trail, and then pretty much the rest of my hiking in the state of Nevada was on roads. Hmm. Um, you were done messing around? I was done messing around. <laughs> I was pretty done after Idaho, and then I was done after that, and then um, 
once I got to Ely, I just decided I was having trouble with Prima's feet because of all the roads and everything. And I um, wanted to, we, we hiked Idaho pretty slow and Idaho is our longest state for sure. But I was kind of like, well, there's a lot of road walking anyways, even if I do one or two more ridge walks, um, because I had to go around the Grand Canyon no matter what, um, which was going to entail a lot of road walking. And I wasn't sure about the water, so I ended up getting, like, a dog stroller <laughs> and had it sent to Ely and then just committed to road walking until I got to um, the Prescott area in Arizona. So so sounds a bit less magical than the Colorado sounds less <laughs> Sounds less magical. I still thought it was incredible. It's a different experience. Certainly, in my experience of talking to other through hikers and I love associating with other through hikers, but I think most people wouldn't appreciate that kind of adventure for me i thought it was still wonderful a lot of the valleys with the dirt roads in nevada i hardly saw anyone um especially once i got off the main county roads um even though there's traffic noises as long as you have a good shoulder i don't really mind road walking and i think that yes you can drive a road and it's the same but it's a different experience when you're walking slower have more time to look at things and really appreciate where the water sources are and the plants and everything so I didn't mind it, but it's definitely not for everyone. Mm -hmm. And it definitely also does not sound nearly as cool as all the people are like, oh, I hiked these ridges off trail and all that. But yeah. So if you had to estimate what percentage or maybe a rough number of miles of the hike do you think you spent on road? Oh, a lot. Because <laughs> um, hmm. like I said, there was a fair amount of road on the Idaho Centennial Trail. So probably pretty close to half okay um yeah i would i would love to say less but probably pretty close to half yeah yeah but yeah. to your point you don't mind road yeah, walks. I you like road mind. walks how yeah. would you classify it um to me i mean i prefer dirt road walking the most of course i don't mind i wouldn't necessarily want to do my whole hike walking on the side of a divided highway but as long as there's a solid shoulder which so i walked highway 93 from the hoover dam basically all the way to Baghdad, Arizona, um, which is near Prescott. Um, and uh, I think the town of one of the W towns in Arizona, anyways, near Wiki, yep. Um, with a little bit around I-40 was on some dirt roads. Um, but that was all a nice shoulder for the most part, like basically the size of a car. So I could just put in podcast and jam out. What I do not appreciate is like I had a section between on 93 from getting off the dirt roads and getting into the town in Caliente. So I usually try to walk through towns on routes if I can, instead of hitching in and out. Um, and that section was only like, it wasn't that long. It was maybe 20 miles, but it, you know, it's one of those situations where the shoulder is just the stripe. And so you're like hoping no cars hit you and most of it was fine, but it's like curvy through the mountains. And there's one section where it's like the roads built up on dirt, crossing a wash with guardrails on both sides and it's like I think that's the most nervous I've been about anything on hike where I'm like seeing the cars coming like all right this might be how I die today <laughs> it's getting turned into a pancake on this guardrail right now but yeah there's literally nowhere to go because I have the the dog stroller and I can't move so I was gonna ask that with doing so many miles on roads do you have any scary road stories that's probably the biggest thing was that section just because there was nowhere to go. Um, definitely around Las Vegas was very interesting. So originally I was hoping to maybe get a ferry across Lake Mead um, on the west side of the Grand Canyon. And then I decided just to go around Lake Mead through the Lake Mead National Recreation Area and through past the Hoover Dams inside the stroller. That was like last minute addition. So um, when I was near Las Vegas... A lot of people were nice, but I had, like, someone call the National Park Service and have the National Park Police come check on me and, like, just, like, weird things like that. Someone came up and was asking me about my dogs and then acted like he thought I stole his dog. I was like, I don't really know. Oh. I don't know. Like, people just think you're homeless is the biggest thing. Yeah. And most people are pretty nice, but definitely it feels a little awkward sometimes. So, yeah. For the Arizona section, sorry if I... Yeah missed this part so you did you do the arizona trail except for the grand so canyon portion? because the grand canyon is such a large geological area yeah and um, for those that don't know dogs are not allowed below the rim of the grand canyon um so in hindsight if i did another hike involving that area i'd probably just 
hike the Grand Canyon and have the dogs shuttled around. In this case, I wanted to do the whole thing with the dogs. So there are three bridges between Page, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada that cross the Colorado River. There's the bridge at Page, which is on, we're pretty close to the Navajo Reservation, and then that road goes through the Navajo Reservation. There's the hiker bridge that is in the Grand Canyon, where we were not allowed, and then there is the, like, bridge by the Hoover Dam, slash also the Hoover Dam, and there's, like, nothing else in between that. Mm. So I had to go, like, way around no matter what. (laughs) It probably would have been less miles off the AZT if I'd gone around um, on the Utah, Arizona side, but I thought it would be cool to see the Hoover Dam, so I went around the Hoover Dam and then did a lot of road walking and then got on trails again around Prescott and Agua Fria National Monument. And then I ended up only hiking about half the AZT because I got on the AZT in the Mazatzal Wilderness. So, hmm. Did you have a standout section, day, whatever quantity of time you want to insert there on this journey? Oh, there were lots. It was There were definitely some love-hate, especially in Idaho. Idaho and I had a very love-hate relationship. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, there was a fire when I was about to enter the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness in Idaho, and so I had to backtrack and reroute around that, which was actually really fortunate because I got to hike the South Fork of the Salmon River Trail, which was one of my favorite sections. Um, I was really struggling mentally with this hike for a variety of reasons. Um, it's the first time I've ever, like, uh, should I quit? I don't know. And uh, hiking that section was just, like just amazing like transcendental like completely changed my mindset Hmm. um the whole salmon river section was really cool like along the middle fork and stuff the sawtooths were amazing um i really like wide open skies so i feel like i'm just gonna say this whole (laughs) thing i love the waihee um desert the jarbage was super cool reviews were super cool like i feel like i just loved all of nevada i guess i should say um arizona was cool in general but i definitely loved like the sky islands at the very end um, I've done some hiking in some of the Sky Islands on, like, the New Mexico-Arizona border and just, like, love the boot heel of New Mexico, too. So definitely the last um, 100 miles or so through, like, around Patagonia was really amazing. It's fun to follow on the map as you're yeah. talking, just for anyone listening that wants to rewind and re-listen and do that. That was fun. Um, being that you're doing so much of this hiking, you know, on routes you're creating, not just for this trail but the others – are you having any really good wildlife stories? I feel like I've seen a fair amount. I don't know because I don't know how what other people necessarily see, but I feel like most people assume that with dogs you wouldn't see wildlife, but we see a fair amount. Um, you know, so saw multiple bears in Idaho. One of them, we scared the crap out of each other in, in the Frank. Um, seen feral horses in nevada tons of elk in nevada they were all bugling and like running around our tent and stuff um i think one of my favorite things was i saw finally saw a desert tortoise i'd been looking for desert tortoises since like las vegas because there were signs about them and then i finally saw one in the superstitions and that was super cool um here i'm sure there's a whole bunch of things i'm forgetting but any mountain those, lions i've never seen a cat on the trail i finally Not saw something would me neither yeah no i'm and i'm <laughs> fine with that um, yeah, I've never seen, like, Butte was the first bobcat I've seen was driving here, but I haven't seen Here leaves. specifically tonight? I saw it in Wolf Creek, driving over Wolf Creek Pass, but... To, um, to this recording? Yes, yes. <laughs> Look at that! Nature! <laughs> it was a good day. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've never seen one on the trail. I've never seen lynx on the trail. I've never seen a mountain lion on the trail. Someone showed me prints of, like, mountain lion prints next to my dog's prints. Um, when we got to leaving Chama... They showed me in the next town. They're like, oh, we think a mountain lion was right behind you. Because they were like a couple hours behind me. I was like, all right. Oh, wow. <laughs> so something was following. So, but crazy. I haven't seen them. They're around. I have not seen them, though. Okay. Any moose? Plenty of moose. Um, I don't think I saw any on this trip, but definitely plenty on the CDT. Um, plenty in northern Colorado. I saw like a whole little squad of them in the never summers, like seven of them or something. All just hanging out. So any spooky stories about like camping alone in all these remote places um depends on what your definition of spooky is try me um (laughs) well to date my only two bad animal encounters are with a porcupine in the middle of the night and a bat in the middle of the night so do tell um okay so the porcupine was on the colorado trail 
I was hiking with my friend Quill, that's how she got her trail name, uh, in the San Juans, and we had camped after it was like my first marathon day ever, so we were tired, had dinner, went to bed. Um, I had heard, I'm sure anybody that's hiked in Colorado has heard stories of marmots eating people's like car wires on their car, marmots eating people's trekking poles or gear if you leave outside their tent, and so like 11 at night dead asleep and feel this licking on the side of my tent and that's the first thing that popped in my mind was these hiker stories of marmot eating their gear and I just I guess flailed and kicked it the porcupine through my tent and it got quills in my foot and my tent you so, kicked the porcupine yes. through your tent yes and you got quilled yes did it hit skin yes what they were in my foot like? uh pretty terrible uh, just painful it's hard um North American porcupines have barbed quills, right? So they don't come out easily. And of course, your foot's also very bony. So uh, I tried pulling them out in my tent and it was just, it hurt too much. So my friend and I were just like, well, we'll just go to bed and deal with it later. The worst part is this sucker kept coming back, like on the hour, every hour. Oh, he liked it. Oh, yeah. So we would be like laying there. I couldn't sleep because I had quills in my foot and the adrenaline and everything. And just hear this licking <laughs> either on my tent or my friend had a tarp so she could like see its nose in her tarp. We'd shine the light at it, yell at it, and it just, like, waddle off. So by, like, 2 or 3 in the morning, we just gave up on sleeping. And fortunately, there we were camped by the Elk Creek, so uh, my friend helped me hobble down there, and we soaked my foot until it's numb, and then she yanked him out. But, Ooh. yeah, it was a rough night. Do you worry about infection with that? Um, was a little worried, but it never got infected. It didn't turn red or anything, so yeah. it was fine after the next day. So, And what happened with the bat? Um, so the bat was much worse <laughs> in a lot of ways. <laughs> Um, so my boyfriend came and visited me when I was near Las Vegas and helped me resupply, which was nice. And then we were car camping before he was going to drop me off the next day in his truck. And like in the middle of the night, I would like roll over and hear the squeaking noise by my head and then roll back over because I'd want it to stop. It happened two or three times. And later on the night, I heard this like scratching sound in the corner. I was like, well, that's weird. There shouldn't be any mice up here or anything. We have the dogs. And then finally, after going to the bathroom, got my light out and looked and it was a bat and I was like oh how cute like you know I, I like critters I've worked with animals for a long time I was like, oh it's so cute like rescued it sat on the truck so it could fly away and then we're laying there and it was just like rabies yeah. <laughs> rabies is a thing <laughs> I just let it go now we don't know if it has rabies so we went to the clinic the walk-in clinic in the morning they're like oh no you got to go to the hospital mesquite are so you worried it, about you or the dogs or me both? okay yeah because it was by my head did it does it have to bite you in order to? So according to the CDC, what we learned is um, with bats, because they're so small, it's really hard to detect their bites or any scratches. And so if it's been sleeping, if you've been sleeping by a bat, and especially in that case, it was like right next to my head, they just go ahead and do preventative treatment. Because once you contract rabies and start having symptoms, there's no You're treatment. Yeah. yeah. There's like only one is person. Is that that's really true? It's so yeah. bad. Rabies is insanely bad. I mean, I've seen like a movie once where the dog got rabies. I don't remember it. Yeah. But it's I like real life. I know it's bad. Yeah, everyone yeah. knows rabies is yeah. bad, right? It, but you don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. Rabies. So how long do you have to treat it? So that was the annoying thing. So I had to go to the hospital. They gave me like four really large needles in my butt with immunoglobins, which no. was pretty terrible. And then a rabies vaccine in my shoulder. And then I had to get Can another you do the vaccine retroactively. Yes. Yeah. So the immunoglobins just like get your um, like immune system jump started to start like fighting any that might be in your bloodstream or yeah. whatever. And then the vaccine trains all the rest of your immune system to continue to fight it off. Huh. Is my understanding. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, so a nurse or something knows different speak up but yeah. um yeah so i had to get that and then i had to get another vax just the vaccine on day three day seven and day 14. wow oh. so that was a huge thing was luckily it was during that roadblock section but um so i had to go get an uber into las vegas from like lake mead three days later and then i ran my little self down the highway to kingman arizona and had to go back had to go back to the hospital to get the third one and then um, once I got to Prescott, so in Arizona, they make you go to the hospital to get rabies vaccines, which was a little frustrating. So my boyfriend came and picked me up and took me back to Nevada so I could get the last one of Walgreens. But. What are the people at this Vax place thinking about you at the time? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, the nurse that came in when I was in Kingman, Arizona, came in and she was like asking me about drugs and alcohol. She's like, well, do you drink? No. 
do you do drugs? No. So what are you here for? It's like, <laughs> do I look that trashy? <laughs> of course, once I told her what she was doing, she was like, I, I can't believe you're doing that and all the things. But it was just, yeah, definitely when she came in, just she seemed to have the impression that I was like homeless or something was the impression I got. But So did you get an answer for how long you would have to leave rabies untreated before I it develops? never asked. Okay. They just, I think it's not like, like you don't have to go in right up like you know i waited a couple hours i noticed the bat in the middle of the night we didn't go in until the next morning i got an answer from google oh, yeah um oh come on show it again untreated show it again it said um three weeks to three months wow oh. is that right um so world health organization uh the incubation period for rabies is typically two to three months but may vary from one week to one year so. depending on factors such as location of virus entry and the viral load oh, okay it's a little bit less freaky how long yeah. can rabies go unnoticed? What does this thing say? I've just recently seen some videos of like w- when someone gets to the stage where they can't hold down liquid. Yeah, where they're like afraid of water. Yeah. 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 That, you're like up a creek by that point. As yeah. the disease progresses, the person may experience delirium, abnormal behavior, hallucinations, hydrophobia, fear of water, and insomnia. The acute period of disease typically ends after two to ten days. One clinical sign, once clinical signs of rabies appear, the disease is nearly always fatal. Um, I feel like this is a valuable nugget for people <laughs> to be hearing. So if there's ever a bat in your tent, just go get treated. Well, yeah. Nice. And it's good to know because there are, like, you'll see signs around, like, the Mexican border on the AZT about there being animals with rabies. And when I went to the BLM office in Kingman to ask them about some route stuff, they were telling me to watch out for animals with rabies. So I was like, mm. well, ha, 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 I'm already yeah. getting treated. So. Yeah. And the dogs had their rabies vaccine. Yeah. And I think they were less concerned with the dogs or my boyfriend was just, since it was like right there. Yeah. I'm like, I could hear it next to my head that yeah. I'm like, yeah, you should probably get treated right. for that. But Damn, Confirmed rabies has occurred as long as seven years after exposure. Oof. But generally 20 to 60 days. That's a strong immune system. Yeah. Well, so that was bat facts. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sweet. That good question, Chance. That was a fun story. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> any other standout stories that we should know about on any subject? Uh, I don't know. I can't. I think that was kind of the main one. Yeah. You ever pooped your pants? I have not. Mm-hmm. Um, I've peed on my dogs though. Intentionally? No. I was trying to go to the bathroom <laughs> and one of them ran right underneath me. So I was like, well, great. Thanks, oh. guys. <laughs> Did I ever tell the story? I did the exact same thing. No. I, I was on a day hike and I had to go so bad, but it was like in. I think it's somewhere on the CDT near Berthoud Pass. Uh, and, you know, there's enough hikers around that you have to be mindful, but it's you're above tree lines. So, like, you can't really ditch out anywhere. So, like, I peel off the pee, and I'm, like, looking around, and all of a sudden I look down, and the pee's going directly into Sierra's face. <laughs> <laughs> In my defense, I didn't, like, start aiming on her. She came up to me because, she, like, she and just And she's always, not leaving? She's no, just, like... No, she just was happy with the golden shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so wow. that was that. Uh, well... Billy, this has been a ton of fun, really unconventional backpacking journey you've been on. Uh, definitely some really novel subjects here. I appreciate that. Let people know about your YouTube YouTube channel and your Instagram because people need to go look at your pups. They're both very cute. Skittles especially. Uh, looks like quite the charmer. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm not super consistent, but I do um, both my YouTube and my Instagram is the most important step. Um, or like on YouTube, if you just look up through hiking with dogs, I think I come up that way too. So, is there a story behind the name? Oh, it's like my one of my favorite quotes. So again, going back to I really like reading and sci-fi fantasy. Um, so if anybody's familiar with Brandon Sanderson, um, his Stormlight Archive books, he has a quote that the most important step a person can take is always the next one, and I figured that was really good and applicable to hiking. So perfectly fitting awesome well thank you so much for sharing your journey and joining us here on backpacker radio yeah thanks for having me to the trek propaganda portion of today's show uh i have a lot on my list here we'll see how much i actually get to but the first one i want to feature is from a name you've heard since the origin of this podcast this is actually to give the full context here the inspiration for this article actually came from a podcast that we did with Sir Pony, aka Clay Bonnyman Evans, where he was talking about his frustrations with Far Out. That was the thing that initially clued me into it. Then I think we either had another guest or there was somebody else I was talking to in like a writer's chat, I can't recall, 
Um, and just hearing multiple instances of people complaining about Far Out being glitchy um, clued me into the fact that this was a bigger thing than I think I had originally realized. I s put Maggie Slepian, who was our original managing editor, onto this subject because I thought it was one that required careful attention, and she turned out another banger. This one is How Far Out's 2023 Glitches Highlight the Drawbacks of Backcountry Tech Reliance. Um, and by no means is this a hit piece on Far Out. Let me just state that I'm a backpacker, hiker trash. I love Far Out like everybody else. Just highlights the fact that if we become too reliant on tech, even if something works 99% of the time, if you are leaning on something that breaks 1%, that's going to put you in a bad situation. So um, definitely need to make sure that you've got strong navigational skills away from these apps that we become so reliant on. Uh, I'm going to read a clip from this piece uh, just to give fuller context to the issue in case you haven't heard Pony's most recent episode. Because Far Out is such a ubiquitous through hiker tool, glitches or bugs can have a notable impact throughout the community. This past season, users reported a higher volume of issues than in any season since Far Out's initial release. Starting in mid-spring, comments and reports appeared on social media in conversation and amongst this website's writers and bloggers. The famously reliable through hiking app was being buggy in inconvenient spots and it was driving hikers nuts. Smartphone apps have become essential navigational tools in the backcountry. Reports included maps vanishing when users zoomed in, logging hikers out during periods without reception, waypoints not appearing on the map, and the app freezing. All issues the Far Out team had never encountered in such volume. Um, definitely want you guys to go check out this full piece because it really gives a nice rundown on exactly what went wrong, the cause behind the issue, which Far Out uh, did own up to who it affected. This was primarily iPhone people, to my understanding. And again, just offers a important reminder on why we should not be so reliant on tech and especially not just one tool. The next piece I want to tackle, which one am I gonna go with? Let's go with, uh, given the time of the year, this is probably the most relevant, the top footwear on the AT in 2023. This is uh, the first gear installment from the AT through hiker survey um, not to give away too much here but the Lone Peak was once again the top dog uh, and although the top three models were the same as the previous year so it went the Lone Peak Olympus and the Speed Goat which is what I wear uh, there was a lot of shifting in the lower ranks so I don't know if that's a sign of things to come you, obviously we've heard many guests on this show complain about various frustrations with Ultra, um, or if that's just the normal progression of things, but definitely some very interesting takeaways in this piece as always. And one data point that I wanna highlight from this one is that this year, 90% of AT hikers primarily wore trail runners. I forget exactly what the number was. I cited this on a recent episode, uh, but we, had, we started doing this survey in 2015, and I wanna say it was about 90% boots at that point, maybe it wasn't quite that high, but uh, pretty crazy to see how much the gear world has changed in such a short amount of time. And to avoid me rambling further, I think I'm gonna save these other two pieces for a forthcoming episode. So let's go to today's question of the day. This was a funny one. This feels like <laughs> you, but I don't recall this one popping up in the thread, so. It was me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it feels like you, but I didn't, I didn't see the person. Yeah. Um. <laughs> just even funny to read <laughs> okay how many owls would you have to see in a singular day before you knew something was wrong yeah very good and important question um, <laughs> i asked the hard hitting ones yeah and i put some thought into this and i actually came up with an exact number because i don't know if that is what you're going for with yeah, this it is. okay i think so you see one owl you're like sweet my yeah. days. This is a good day. I get to tell people about this. Hopefully I got a photo. You see two. That's a crazy fucking coincidence. Like that's a, you're, that's going to happen once in your life, barring you being at like a zoo or like a wild animal refuge or something like that. I think three is really? the exact number. If you see three owls in a single day, uh, I, I think wrong wouldn't necessarily be the word that I'd go with. Maybe something suspicious is happening or uh, paranormal, as our friend Mike Clellan would say. I, I wouldn't necessarily get like an ominous feel, although maybe I should. 
but that would be the trigger to me that like oh yeah shit is gonna happen we have very different levels of tolerance okay <laughs> mine's 15 to 20 <laughs> because here's the thing like what if you see three sitting together and then you're like oh some owls you know you don't really yeah. think like something's I, wrong I, I guess barring like baby owls do the owls hang out well i don't know but i also think that if i was hiking and i saw three owls on a fence um i wouldn't freak out i would just be like huh today i saw three owls on a fence yeah but my, at, like, my at the same time, individual instances I, I i don't know if i will hang out in packs at all well i'm just validating for this is how i got my number to 15 to 20. Yeah. i should start there my thought process went the exact same as yours where i'm like okay i see an owl we're cool then i see another owl and i'm like huh that's interesting another owl yeah but then my brain started to think well where am i right like if i'm in my day-to-day -day of denver yeah working from home and I see these outside of the window. Yeah, something it, weird is happening. Two is probably the number at night. But if I'm out hiking on trail, you know, you hear barred owls a lot. You, I would, I would be able to convince myself that's fine. Yeah. Have Three, you ever had a day where you've seen more than one? No, but I also am good at making myself feel like I'm the crazy one. So three or four owls, I'd probably be telling myself I'm in an area. This is that, a very owly day. <laughs> this is like a big owl area. I must have missed that on my maps. Five to six owls would reinforce that. And yeah. I'd be like, yeah, I'm definitely in like an owl area. Yeah. And I just missed that somewhere. Yeah. And I think once I start going over 10. So you're seeing 10 owls and you're like, man, what a. Something, something <laughs> strange is happening. <laughs> but if, if I'm deciding when I am actually panicking and saying something is very wrong yeah i think it has to hit like around 15 owls you have a high tolerance for owls i'm i just have a good tolerance for making like convincing myself i'm the problem yeah it's not the owls it's me i didn't look at my maps i missed this detail there must have been a comment somewhere it's me yeah it's me um, uh yeah yeah that's a large number of i would I would be like, did someone slip mushrooms into my diet at some point during the day? Because that's too many owls. I would think like that would be when I'd start wondering about like my personal safety and if I was about to die. Yeah. It would be 15. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That, let us know your owl threshold at podcast at the truck.co or head on over to backpackradio.com. I was also going to make that the sticker code. Tell us how many owls yeah, there you, you can go. take. Okay. Which will be really funny too because our guest has not partaken in this. So if she just sees the social media and yeah, she like, bailed on the segments, <laughs> <laughs> she's being the really good. What owl talk about? This is a weird podcast. <laughs> I was talking about bats. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's do the Triple Crown. Sure. This one is me. I contribute few of them, but uh, this I was inspired recently because this is a word that. Well, I guess let me first introduce it. So this is the triple crown of words that you will never be able to spell correctly. Uh -huh. um, and I'll, I'll go first because I'm going to give the inspiration to this segment. And if you asked me to spell the word today, I could because it's been... Today? No, no, no. I'm, the word that I'm about to give, <laughs> if you asked me to spell that today, <laughs> I would get it right. But like, if I go six weeks without being reminded of how it's spelled for whatever reason i'm so far off that not even the red line has any idea what i'm talking about okay. like it, it thinks i'm giving someone's name or something but mannequin how often are you writing the word mannequin infrequently enough that i forget how to spell it every okay, single wait, time let me say <laughs> m-a-n-n-e-q-u-i-n -N -E yeah that's exactly right yes i i I'm in the eighth grade spelling bee i start off with like the word manic like you're having an episode, like a manic episode. Oh. So I'm like, oh, maybe it's a K instead of a C. And yeah, the red line's like, dude, I don't know what you're trying to do. When here. you go to the K, you're too far. Yeah, it's I. I literally. There have been multiple times where I have to get the spelling of the word by just like speaking it into my phone and seeing <laughs> what it outputs. I'm like, oh yeah, I wasn't even the the right country for this one. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mine has no story for the first one. I made the list over my honorable mentions based on frequency, and that's separate. You want to try to spell it? S I like this. S-E-P-A-R-A-T-E? Yeah. I always go double E's. I yeah. go S-E-P-E-R. Because <laughs> I think in my head, separate. I, I think if I wasn't uh, triggered to that word, because that is kind of 
the intuitive way to spell it is separate and separate the same word yeah i don't th- i don't know i think one of those pronunciations is not a pronunciation separate that's not the same word no because you can you can say put things separately and just a difference you wouldn't say put things separately but that's the same word yeah okay we're doing a whole grammar lesson here today <laughs> well so, you know when you look at a word for so long that you start to like feel weird I, I remember this to this day. I think this was seventh grade where we had to read out loud in class and uh, I was reading and I came on the word com promise <laughs> and the teacher's like, good try. <laughs> but no, it's compromise. Um, we had, there was a girl, I won't say her name, but this was fifth grade and she was reading the textbook in social studies and she said Arkansas instead mm. of Arkansas. Mm-hmm. That one took a while to move on from. Um, There's, I've run into adults that don't know how to sta- say the state that I'm from. Denial. State of <laughs> denial. Nice. Um, Illinois. Yeah. They, they, they add the S on. Oh, Illinois. Yeah. Got it. Um, okay, my second one. I'm still going to go in order of difficulty. And this one um, affected me last night in a spelling sense, not a literal sense, but I was going through the pooping in the woods entries and like cleaning up my notes and diarrhea. I, okay. I cannot spell the word diarrhea. <coughs> I even spelled it wrong, writing it down to not forget it. Uh, D-I-A-R-R-H-E-A? Yeah. I am not proud to admit that I probably use that in my text threads on a really, way too regular basis. Yeah, for me it's D I H. A R R E A D I A H like it just it doesn't even Actually, start. That, I don't get anywhere. That prompts another one. I might swap this out. Uh, so diarrhea is a hard one. Diarrhea is a hard one. Only in the figurative sense. Only though. in the spelling. Yeah. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, the three examples I gave myself are all M words. Apparently, I struggle with M's, but. <laughs> I'm going to throw in a swerve because your word prompted me to another word that I often struggle with. I can never get this one right. Nausea. Ooh. N-A-U-S-E-A. Yeah. Nausea. Well, you have to, it's like compromise where you, in your head, you say compromise because that's what I say in my head. But I say nausea. Nausea. Sure. Now, how do I say it? I say it in my head differently than it sounds. Yeah. Uh, I guess maybe I'll try to remember it. N- nas uh like cause yeah i know how to spell cause no because then you forget the e after the s so you have to do like c at the end but there's an e in cause yeah but there's an a after it yeah so nas uh cause oh. uh spelt yeah but for whatever reason or nauseous i don't know which one of those is harder but uh those nauseous f- that's how i say it in my head yeah that one fucks me up a lot okay um, my last one is technically I have two, but we'll save it for honorable mention. Maintenance. Yeah. I'm gonna give it a shot. Yeah, M A I N T E N A N C E. Yeah. But you said it the way I would say it in my head, which is maintenance instead of maintenance. Right. I, yeah, I'm picturing maintenance. Yeah, no, I've got to say the the N isn't silent in my head, but I think when you say it normally ends kind of silent yeah that one fucks me up yep but i get it close enough that the red line's like i know what you're trying to do um that yeah that one's a hard one yeah do you have any more do we do i have honorable mentions okay uh three no where's my third word what was the third oh i do have one more i'm going to go with embarrass Double R, double S. Yeah, and I always do one R. Yeah. Yeah, that is a tricky one, but I'm, I feel good about that one. Cool. My lone honorable mention, though there are tons of words that I get wrong on a regular basis, it's like using a calculator. You just, I don't have to memorize these things because it's just a, the quickest fix at, at all times, but these are the ones that I continually get wrong. I don't know why I'm writing this word so regularly, but Mediterranean. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, Again, I think this is another example of me not using it regularly, so I don't. It doesn't happen frequently enough that I actually retain what okay. the mistake is. 
M E D I T E R A wait Mediterranean M E D where did I leave off I T E R R A I keep forgetting what the word is by the time I get <laughs> terrain I N E N um, well that was the sound the end I want to use is I A N terrain E N terrain E N I A N I A N is that how it ends you no you got off to a hot start and it got rough I keep forgetting again. the word <laughs> yeah that that's it's like a whole Hold journey on. I want one more where I write one Mediterranean. Yeah, okay, I got it. Okay. M E D I T E R R A N I A N. Close. E A N. Bitches. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay. But that's pretty good. Being off by one letter is, uh, I think that's a win. Well, we can uh, we can all agree now that that's a hard word to spell. <laughs> um, my two honorable mentions when I first moved to Cincinnati. Mm. It took a long time to remember if it was two N's or two T's. One T, two N's, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, but I did have to Google it to make sure. Yeah. After living there for a year just now, I still have to Google it. Yeah. And then the other one, this one's got a nice story. As I mentioned, I've won the eighth grade spelling bee. <laughs> um, my mom bribed me with a Dooney and Burke watch because uh, she thought that would get me off her back. That was great uh, motivation. I think I've told that story before, so that's why I'm trying to grace past it. But... The winning word, oh, Amy had just gotten out right before me. And so I get the winning word. If I get this right, I win. If I get this wrong, then me and her have to do one more round. And the teacher gives me the word license. And like this was like the, the book, the hard words in the hard book was like idiosyncrasy, like all kinds of crazy stuff. And I got license and she was my sixth grade teacher. So there was all rumors abound that I got an easy word Conspiracy, to yeah. give me the win. Totally. Dude, I can't freaking spell license. I don't know if the S comes first or the C comes first. So everyone's sitting there like they tossed her an easy bone. And I'm like, I can't get out on license. I need to um, write it down to feel confident. Yeah. So I like I, I got it right. But I okay, had yeah. so I, much stress in my mind. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I'm cheating now because it's pulling it up. I typed it into my Gmail to hopefully not give it away, but apparently I got an email from license plate toll payment. At, oh, I hate them. Yeah, but so I know the answer. You uh, want to tell? L I C E N S E. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sneaky C and S in the word license. Yeah. So that one has a nice place in my heart. I think of it every time I hear the word. So license. that's the one that you lost the spelling bee on? No, I won it. I got it right. Okay. But they thought I was taking that dramatic pause at the C, like to try to make it seem like I didn't know. And sure. it was hard <laughs> when <laughs> really like I did not know. And it was hard. I memorized all the really hard ones, yeah. like all like I could spell all of them. But can, can you spell idiosyncrasy? I D I O S Y N C R A S Y. I assume that's right. <laughs> yeah, like I, I studied, yeah. <laughs> but license wasn't on the list sure. I studied because it was too easy. Yeah. And the C and the S, they're hard. I, I don't know which stand-up comedian this was, but he, he had a joke about like if somebody went up and put a gun to his mother's head and said like, you need to correctly spell restaurant or employing the trigger, <laughs> he would just be like, I'm so sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, spelling words. Yeah. That was fun. Uh, yeah, let us know your challenging <laughs> words because everyone's got their own things and you're always like, oh, yeah, that one's easy. But uh, it's, it's all fun and games until it happens to you, until it's your license. And if we're like, when we, we're going to get to the five star review, we're not there yet. But when we get there, if you, in a, in a swerve to hard words to spell, know any good hard words to say, leave a review that's five stars and ask for Zach to read it. Sure. I'm happy to butcher those are my words. moments of joy <laughs> uh, mailbag do you want the mailbag or the review I'll do the mailbag because it's relevant to my story hmm. um, this one was fun to read this one said oranges in stockings my understanding from parents who grew up in the 30s was that this was a rare treat oranges were not typically available in a small town market therefore our families have continued the tradition to remind one another not to take small things for granted from Chris I liked that yeah 
Remind me the origin of this. Um, my Christmas stockings growing up were 90% oranges, mm. and I thought it was to reduce the amount of candy they gave me because my parents were very health conscious. So there's a history to it. That's interesting. Yeah. I'd literally never heard of oranges and stockings, apparently. I thought it was an Italian thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, five star review. This is from Beer Town Bill. The title of the review is episode 176. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts, but particularly enjoyed your interview with Kevin and his take on bicycle touring. His comments that touring will steal your soul is so true. I through hiked the PCT, AT, CT, and TRT, but in 2022 decided to try touring. I rode 3,965 miles from Yorktown to Astoria. It was an incredible journey. That being said, the AZT will be my next endeavor, but I can't wait to do another tour. Beer Town Bill, thank you so much for your review. If you guys want to hear your reviews read on this show, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us any number of stars, just not one, two, three, or four. Um, sticker code, we might have to make something different because we're going to have our question of the day video. And we're probably going to want them right. to tell us their owl answer on the owl video. How about we just make it the words that people struggle spelling? Yes. Their, their stump words. Yeah. Hard words to spell. Yeah. What's your mannequin? <laughs> Sounds weird. <laughs> <coughs> uh, super big thank you to our Chuck Norris Award winners on Patreon. That is Alex and Misty with Navigators Crafting, Andrew, Austin McDaniel, Austin Ford, Brad and Blair with 13 Adventures, Brent Stenberg, Brian Alsop, Tables. Chris. Shit. It's We've, been a while. It's been a minute. Or I we, didn't forget. You forgot. Are we three weeks separated <laughs> from the last podcast? I did forget. Um, yeah, no, it's been a long time. Long I don't time. remember how to speak to people. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Marshburn, coach from Marion Outdoors. Dane, Ish. their cook, Eric Casper. The friendly ghost. Eric Hoffman, Greg Knight, Greg McDaniel. I Iron Hike Endurance Productions, Liz Seeger, Matt Sukup, Mike Poizel, Patrick C. and Cialo, Sawyer Products, Spam, Timothy Hahn, Solo. and Tracy Trigger. Thanks. You can follow us on social at Backpacker Radio on Instagram and TikTok at Backpacker Pod on X, Facebook.com slash Backpacker Radio. You can follow Chance. You can find me on Instagram at Juliana underscore Chauncey, and you can get my book Hiking from Home, a long distance hiking guide for family and friends on Amazon. Appalachian Trials and Pacific Crest Trials are my books. Follow us and subscribe to us on YouTube. What's up, YouTube? Hi, Internet. Uh, I get the emails when we get a new subscriber, and they're happening on a pretty regular basis nowadays. Let's see. What are we up to now? This will be really enthralling for people. <laughs> it's uh, going to be so different when this airs. 691. Oh, that's good. We were at 544 yeah, in December. We're, we're booming. We're wow. in a boom town. Are yeah. we going viral? <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it starts with a six and a nine, so I'm having a real good time with that. <laughs> no more followers. <laughs> yeah, stop. <laughs> Until we get to 6900, then take a long pause. Yeah. That's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening, and happy hiking. Bye.